Last time we took a look at a very simple Ford preprocessor, and now we're going to delve a whole lot deeper. So if you haven't seen the previous video yet, we recommend that you watch that one first. I'm Hans Beesmer and this is Back and Forth. Before we begin, let's take a look at a side project of mine, your basic Ford. It's a simple but capable basic interpreter, completely written in 40H. Of course it lacks certain features like constants or file inclusion, or it doesn't. Here's the program. It defines two constants and includes a square root function. Now let's run it. And yes, it runs. So did I get busy last night? No. The whole thing consists of a tiny make file and one alias. That's all. You may have figured it out by now, but all I did is tweak the C preprocessor a bit by adding a few options at the command line. And presto, you basic Ford can do include files and constants. It may interest you to know that the C language doesn't support true constants either. As we've shown here, they're simply inlined by the C preprocessor. If you don't believe me, take a look at the video in the description. But what makes this interesting is that some of these constants aren't built in. Underscore file, underscore line, yeah, but those are built in. But low and high? No, these are defined. And that's something the simple preprocessor from the previous episode cannot do. Wouldn't it be nice if we could simply define a macro like this? By just adding a keyword name like colon macro, followed by the name of the macro, and terminated by a semicolon. And in between, the definition. Now, how can we get this done? Let's suppose we feed our preprocessor the colon macro keyword. All we have to do is signal we're in a special mode now by setting a flag, and switch the output destination from our output file to a macro buffer. The macro buffer consists of two parts, a structure for storing the names, and a contiguous string buffer for the content. The next thing that is parsed is the name of the macro. We store that one in the macro name structure, and along it the current value of the string buffer pointer which in this case is pointing to the very beginning of the buffer. And now we start recording our macro. The first token that comes in is float. We store this one in the string buffer, along with its terminator, which is a null character, and increment the pointer accordingly. The next token is array. Well, the same procedure as last time, James. Finally, the semicolon just stores a terminator. Since there are no zero length tokens, this indicates the end of the recording. When the next macro comes in, f% its name is stored, and the pointer associated with the name points to the memory location just after the preceding terminator, ready to store more tokens. Another thing that the semicolon does is shutting down the macro recording by setting the flag and rerouting the output back to the output file. Now, replaying the macro requires an additional check. In our previous iteration, all we had to do was to check whether the token matched the building keyword. If it did, we called the appropriate word. And if it didn't, we simply wrote the token to the output file. But now we have to ask ourselves the question, is it a macro? And if so, we have to replay it. Let's assume it is. We found its name in our macro name structure and simply followed the pointer to see where the contents of the macro reside. Then we start writing the tokens in the string buffer to the output file until we hit a zero length string. Then we're done. And we can read the next token, which in this case is the name of the f variable myfloat. It's stacked conveniently to the end of the entire expression. But we can't always be that lucky. The number following f% has to be enclosed between quotes. So we need a means to parse and store that token temporarily, while the macro is being played back. Introducing the four registers of our preprocessor, which will allow us to do just that. But we also need commands to control those registers. So when we replay a macro, we need to check whether it is an ordinary token or a built-in macro command. If it's the latter, 
we need to execute it, rather than to write it verbatim to the output file. Introducing fetch one fetch. It parses the next token and stores it in register one. Then it continues as normal. Hash one hash is another one which write the contents of register one to the output file and then continues. And that's the way we can handle macros like f%. Now we've got macro commands, we can handle parsing words like a variable without having to assume the proper syntax was used. We're even capable of defining complex parsing words like f%. You may have noticed we placed s quote and quote between backticks. This way tokens will not be recognized as building keywords, but instead send verbatim to the macro buffer. We will see why this is a vital feature a little later on. Finally, we are even capable of handling a word like f constant. Note that the first part, the allocation of memory, is completely identical to f variable. So, since we defined that one already, why not reuse it? Factoring out identical code is the fourth way, isn't it? But that means that when replaying the macro, we not only have to check whether it's a macro command, we also have to check whether it's a macro. That's done by simply recursing, which causes the macro concert to be replayed, after which the original replay is resumed. That's cute, if I may say so myself. We can also observe while backticks are so vital to this program. F constant must be terminated by a semicolon. If it wasn't backticked, the preprocessor would assume that the macro definition has ended. And that's not what we want to do here. The inescapable conclusion is, is that we don't need to hard code any of these macro definitions. They can simply be defined at the start of the program. It also means that if any other parsing words come along, like the ones in 4.2012, we just have to define them, without ever changing a single line of the preprocessor itself. So, is this the end of the rabbit hole? Not by a long shot. You've seen nothing yet. So, if you don't want to miss that, subscribe and hit that bell button. It really helps this channel and that means I can upload more often. Anyway, I'm Hans Bezemer and this was another episode of Back and Forth. Woo!